Hello. Welcome to the Paradigm Shift, Episode 8, The Heart of David, a True Warrior of God. I'm Apostle Matthew Schumacher. There are lots of teachings about David. I take it to a little bit different level, a little bit different perspective in looking into the life of David. What I'm looking into is how can we apply the life of David to ourselves, of course, on a personal level, and also learn something from the kingdom that David was a part of. What I mean is, there's the kingdom of God, and there's also the kingdom of Israel, which David played a key role in. Is there anything that we can discern about David that is applicable to today in the establishment of the kingdom of God on the earth? I would suggest to you that that's very true. And that, in fact, that is one of the primary reasons that David is in the Word of God for those that are in the last days, the days that we live in. We live in monumental times where the kingdom of God is going to grow like the rock that stuck the statue at its feet and grew and filled the whole earth in the book of Daniel. Join me as we explore the life of David and glean wisdom and understanding for our lives and our times and for the establishment of the kingdom of God and its expansion on the earth today. Briefly, I alluded to David's life giving us insight into the battles that we face as individual people. We can all learn from David and how he faced Goliath, how he dealt with Saul, the trouble that David got himself into. He was certainly a, a flawed person, and we do get ourselves into trouble sometimes. David can show us things and model things for us that we can apply personally to our own lives. But remember, David was a man that received a promise from God. And that promise was individual for him, but it was that he would be a king of a kingdom. Now, what is the kingdom of God? And we were made kings and priests before him. See, you are a king and a priest. You are a subordinate to the king of kings. If Jesus is the king of kings, then you are a king of some kind. You see... He has made us kings and priests unto our God. You have a jurisdiction and a dominion as a component of the larger kingdom of God. And so when we view the individual promise of David through the eyes of establishing a kingdom, then we can see how God is speaking to us about using us, giving us a personal promise, that is tied to kingdom jurisdiction, the kingdom of God being expanded on planet earth and God using you as that ambassador, that king, that officer that expands his dominion on this planet. When we look at it through that context, we understand that <laughs> the Israelites were establishing a kingdom in the promised land. <laughs> So God's made some promises to Christianity. We'll be the head, not the tail, above and not beneath. You see, there's a coming, a move of God, and we need to begin to prepare for it. How do we posture ourselves to expand the kingdom at large? And how do we posture ourselves as individuals so that it can be established and uh, flow through us? When we begin to look into some of the attributes of David 
We see many things. We see many things that are applicable to the warrior company that God has uh, chosen to raise up in the days that we live in. You are a warrior of God, whether you know it or not. If you are volunteering to serve God at this point in time in history, you are a warrior. So rise up and be a warrior of God. Militant, yes, but not in human militancy. Militancy in expanding a spiritual kingdom that has dominion over all. And the byproduct of of this kingdom is righteousness, peace, and joy. And so, be eager like David was. <laughs> David was eager. You see, we see this model when David hears about what's happening with Goliath. He arrives on the scene. He's actually bringing bread and cheese for his brothers. And he arrives on the scene after looking after some flocks he gets to the battle lines where the Israelites have arrayed themselves against the Philistines and Goliath is coming out repeatedly cursing the people of God speaking ill things over God's people and David <laughs> a little shepherd boy says hey what is this guy doing? Of course, I'm paraphrasing. But you can see that attitude in everything that David says and does. Others are there trying to slow David down. <laughs> Saul even says, well, <laughs> you can't fight him. You are but a youth. <laughs> but David, he was eager to get into the battle. Be eager to confront the things that stand in the way of the kingdom of God. God will be with you. <laughs> be eager to expand the kingdom because when you do, you're expanding righteousness, peace, and joy. When Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the men, he burned with anger at him and asked, Why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. 1 Samuel 17, 28. And then Saul says, Saul replied, You are not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You are only a young man. And he's been a warrior from his youth. 1 Samuel 17:33. <laughs> Can you see how David ignored some people and did <laughs> what God was telling him to do anyway? That lion of God rose up inside of David. That spirit of God that acts like a lion <laughs> rose up in him. And he was eager to get to the battle because there was no fear in him. Then David moves on and you can see David is approaching the Goliath situation differently. He's unique. He's not afraid to do things his own way. In other words, he's not looking for approval from all the people around him. We need to remember that. When you're establishing the true kingdom, you need to know that other people who may have been serving God a long time and may have been Christians or attending church a long time. They're going to look at you and say, why are you doing things that way? That's not the way we would do it. That's not the way we've done it for centuries. Well, guess what? You need to understand that when God lays it on your heart to do things differently, that's the way you're to do it. You see, you're about to get a result that nobody else has gotten. <laughs> don't be afraid to be unique you don't need the approval of everyone around you you need the approval of the Most High he's the one that matters David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them I cannot go in these he said to Saul 
because I'm not used to them. So he took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the string, put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with his sling in his hand approached the Philistine. 1 Samuel 17, 39 and 40. Can you see that most people <laughs> wouldn't have said, hey, this giant, I'm about to go fight him. Let me pick up some rocks and get this stick. <laughs> David was definitely uh, not mainstream in his approach to battle. <laughs> he's wearing no armor, and he's picking up rocks <laughs> and a stick. <laughs> well, those rocks and a stick represent stumping. That stick is like a shepherd's crook. Remember, David is a shepherd. It's like the apostolic authority being picked up in David's hand. Now, <laughs> most people don't recognize that, but David is exemplifying something for us in the modern day. And then he picks up five smooth stones and puts them in his back. What's that? Well, there are the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. You see, you are a stone. So what he's doing, he doesn't even know it, but he's representing God's fivefold ministry. And they're smooth stones, so they've been washed by the water of the Word of God for a long time. <laughs> you see, that's what it takes to move out in authority. You have to stand under the washing of the water of the Word until you're ready to go to battle. And so, fearlessness. <laughs> Even seasoned soldiers had uh, shuddered at the voice of Goliath. Not David. <laughs> David's picking up sticks and rocks to go after a giant. <laughs> you see, he's not dependent on himself, though. He's going in the name of the Lord. So that's what you're doing. When you move out to establish the kingdom, no matter what realm it's in, whether you're going into the business realm, education, entertainment, it doesn't matter. Remember that if you're doing it because you're on a mission from God, you don't come in your own strength, but you come in the strength of the Most High God. <laughs> That's the kingdom that you represent. So don't ever let Satan talk you into thinking you're standing in your own strength. Otherwise, that's just exactly what you'll do. You'll stand in your own strength and experience something that you don't want to experience. However, if you're standing in the strength of God with his backing, if he says, yes, that's what I want you to do, now you have the backing of the Most High. You're in an entirely different scenario. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. 1 Samuel 17, 48. Can you see that David wasn't afraid of a fight? <laughs> That's the way that a Christian ought to be. We, we think about Christians uh, sometimes as being uh, feeble, cowardly. No, no. We don't resort to the same weaponry as everybody else does. But there shouldn't be anything cowardly about a Christian. The first century Christians died by being crucified upside down or burned at the stake or decapitated altogether. But did they give up their faith? No, they did not. That's the warrior of the Most High rising up in you, saying, I will not compromise, no matter how loud and incessant you get. I'm not going to. I'm going to serve my God. That's what I'm going to do. That's a mighty warrior of the Most High. David was also faithful. He always returned to God and pursued the will of God. David did step out of faithfulness. 
at times. But you see how David returned to God. You see, he never blamed God for the problems that he made. Meaning, David knew that he was responsible. He was intimate enough with God and understood God well enough to know that it wasn't God's fault. It was his own. We should all be that way. Be faithful to God. Don't blame him for things that either you or some other person around you in your life is responsible for. It's not God's fault. God is faithful. And so we should be faithful to him. Know that he's always looking out for your best interests. David was persistent. Wow, <laughs> was he ever persistent. When you start talking about Saul chasing David, he did that for a long period of time. David winds up, first he's being kind of uh, a couple of attempted assaults, <laughs> if you will, occurred around the kingdom or around the presence of the throne of Israel. Saul throws a javelin at David one day. <laughs> and he's constantly doing these little plots to try to get David killed by the Philistines. <laughs> and uh, Saul winds up being so uh, afraid and intimidated by David that he actually winds up chasing David into caves and David lives in caves hiding from Saul for a long period of time but David never never <laughs> gave up on the promise that God gave him you see God said he would be king and when he had the opportunity to take the situation into his own hands he refused you see, David had the opportunity to kill Saul more than once. And remember, <laughs> David was a mighty warrior. If David had actually wanted to take Saul on, he could have taken him. But you see, that was not the methodology of David. He relied upon the Lord. He knew that you shouldn't lay your hands to God's anointed. So he refused to take David, take Saul down himself. He knew that God would be true to the promise that was given to David. That he would be king of Israel. And it would be so by the hand of God and not by his own human efforts. Can you see the obedience of David? Man, <laughs> many of us would say David was obedient to a fault. <laughs> You know, when Saul threw a javelin at him, how many of you <laughs> would said, oh, wow, that was rude and just walked out of the room? <laughs> or <laughs> would you have picked the javelin up and thrown it back? <laughs> Most people would do that. You throw a spear at me, I'll pick it up and throw it back at you. <laughs> That's not what David did. Wow. <laughs> what a different perspective on things he didn't had subsequent chances to kill Saul and didn't can you see the deep seated obedience that David had he screwed up he did and we'll get to that but can you see the obedience in the heart of David that he had for enormous portions of his life and in very high pressure situations. Saul's trying to kill him. And David will not kill Saul. You see the threat to David's life would have been instantly relieved. All David had to do was kill Saul. But he refused. He waited upon the Lord. What obedience. We should be that obedient. We get a promise from God. We should learn and apply the promise of God is our primary weapon and not our own hands, not our own human efforts. 
There may be times that the Lord leads us into personally confronting some things, verbally or otherwise. But we need to be sure that it's the Lord leading us and that we're not being led by our human flesh and being pulled into a situation that God really hasn't blessed. We need to maintain that posture of obedience in all things. And when you do that, when you take your hands off of what is blocking you, God will put His hands on. He's a hands-on God. He will ask you to do some things in conjunction with His efforts. But, <laughs> oh, He is faithful. He is faithful to put His hands in a situation where He is needed. As long as you're obedient, you can count on God doing His part. He'll do His part and much more. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Psalm 27.1 Can you see how much trust David put in the Lord? Wow. He was trusting you can see a theme of character here. There's a reason that God called David a man after his own heart. Can you see how obedient David is? Can you see how much he trusted in the strength and power of God and not his own human hands? He's trusting the Lord for everything. The Lord is his light. Meaning he illuminates my path. He's my salvation. I don't save myself, but God saves me. <laughs> wow. What a trust. You need to think about David in these terms also. He was extraordinarily merciful. He spared the guilty over and over and over. Of course, there was Saul that I mentioned before, who's tried to kill David <laughs> uh, throughout his life. Uh, and David spares his life multiple times. There's Absalom, David's own son. Absalom uh, tries to take the kingdom from David and takes all of David's concubines on the roof and has sex with him where everyone can watch. And David <laughs> is concerned about Absalom. Wow. He doesn't even want Absalom killed when David takes his own kingdom back. <laughs> Interesting. And then there's Shimei, who personally cursed David to his face. And then when David comes back into power after a time of turmoil, David says, no, don't kill him. <laughs> Can you see how merciful David is? Here's three people, Saul, Absalom, and Shimei, and that is not necessarily exhaustive. These are just major examples of when David had every reason, and he's the king, he had every reason to kill these people. Saul, he wasn't the king at the time, but Saul had personally tried to kill him multiple times, and David had been anointed by Samuel to be king of Israel. So, <laughs> most people would have said, hey, Saul had it coming to him, kill him. No, that's not David's approach. Then there's Absalom, his own son, a traitor. And Shimei cursed David to his face. All three of those guys, David's like, nah, don't kill him. <laughs> uh, can you see the difference in David's approach? You can glean something about what God is talking about in David concerning the posture of his heart. 
It's different. That's why God compared the heart of David to his own. You see, God's looking for reasons to be merciful. He is. There comes a time when he has to deal authoritatively with sin. That's true. But God's all the time trying to figure out a legitimate way to have mercy on you <laughs> and on me. Wow. What a good God. We need to have mercy toward others. You see, you must give mercy to receive mercy. We see this in David's life. David killed Uriah. This was a major misstep in the life of David. In the morning it happened that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah and he wrote in the letter saying, Set Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle and retreat from him that he may be struck down and die. 2 Samuel 11.14 The backdrop to this scenario is David liked Uriah's wife and he wanted her. And so that's why he had Uriah killed so David could have his wife. Now, of course, uh, David was not lacking <laughs> for opportunities with the ladies. But he wanted your eyes wife anyway. Can you see what a horrible mistake that was? That was bad. And we look at that and say, wow. I want you to look at how good God has been to David and look what he did. How horrible. Now, God doesn't ignore it. David does pay a price for having done that. But it's kind of strange. David retains his kingdom. <laughs> Isn't that kind of uh, like, God, uh, don't you know that David just did something horrible and you let him keep his kingdom? Well, there may be something working behind that. The strange level of mercy and favor that David received from the hand of God. You see, David gave mercy to others. He gave mercy to Saul, Absalom, and Shimei. You must give mercy to receive mercy. You see, God gave David mercy in the situation because David had given mercy to others multiple times before. David probably didn't know it at the time, but he was sowing into his own future. Treat others how you want to be treated. Isn't that the golden rule? It paid off in David's life. You see, God is faithful. He dealt with David's sin, but he didn't totally annihilate David. David got to retain his kingdom. And had another son. Repent. For the sake of your name, O Lord. Forgive my iniquity. Though it is great. Psalm 2511. We see that David. Did not try to hide. His iniquities. He admitted it. He admitted it. Wow. There's another major factor. In why David seemingly got away with so much killing your eye so he could have his wife and then David uh, just keeps on going having the kingdom keeps right on going keeps experience the favor of God <laughs> wow <laughs> isn't that interesting you see David didn't try to hide his flaws he admitted it and he repented he admitted that they were iniquity and that he should repent. That was the heart of David. He didn't try to hide it. He didn't try to blame somebody else. He said, yeah, 
I'm iniquitous, Lord. Forgive me. God can work with that. Also, David was a mighty warrior. <laughs> David took his men with him and went out and killed 200 Philistines and brought back their foreskins. They counted out the number to the king so that David might become the king's son-in-law. Then Saul gave him his daughter Michael in marriage. 1 Samuel 18.27 <laughs> Can you see that David is a mighty warrior? You see, <laughs> first off he paid double. He was only asked to gather a hundred and he gathered two hundred. There's some hidden messages in that about redemption and about the price that Christ paid. That's not my primary point though. You see, <laughs> 200 foreskins. You don't get somebody's foreskin without a fight. <laughs> uh, David got 200 of them. Listen, while he has a tender heart toward God, David is a mighty dude. <laughs> you don't want to cross blades with this guy. <laughs> we need to be like that. You see? We need to be that mighty that when the enemies of God get in our way, the demonic, uh, etc. We don't take no for an answer. We are mighty. Whenever the enemy puts a blockade in your way, say, I'll smash your blockade and then smash everything attached to it. How's that? <laughs> you see how David did that? He said, 100 foreskins. Yeah, I'll get 200. <laughs> uh, it should cost the enemy when he gets in your way. <laughs> uh, we need to have that attitude instead of being afraid of the demonic. Just totally go at that activity like Satan. <laughs> How foolish are you to try and mess with me, man? <laughs> are you just having... A terrible, terrible day, and you needed somebody to make it worse. <laughs> Is that what you're doing? <laughs> Come on, man. Don't play with me. That's just silly. Are you trying to get your little kingdom destroyed? You see, that's the attitude that we should have as Christians. We have a mighty God that overshadows the enemy to a degree that cannot be overstated. Satan is a little pea or a speck, of, a speck of dust compared to the God of the universe. Understand that when you are moving in the authority of the kingdom, you have the resources of heaven behind you. <laughs> Satan must have suicidal tendencies to come play with you. <laughs> Uh, he just must not be thinking straight. So let him have it. <laughs> have that attitude of might on the inside of you. How dare Satan try to touch you. <laughs> You're a child of the Most High God. And can you see that even though David is mighty and he... <laughs> It's almost like he's hankering for a fight all the time. <laughs> he is intimate with God. He says, I love you, O Lord, my strength. Psalm 18, 1. God is his strength. He knows where his strength comes from. And he loves him. He knows God is for him and not against him. He's got that much figured out. We should have that installed on the inside of us to know that God is for me, he is not against me. God is my strength and I love him. As David said, that should be the posture of our heart. 
Because when you get to that place, you begin to understand, even in your natural mind, that there's nothing that can stop you but yourself. As long as you continually rely upon God and you know that He is your source, He is your salvation. And you love him for who he is in your life. Man. Nothing can stand in your way. Nothing. What a wonderful gift. That borders on fantasy. But yet it's absolutely true. And even true to a degree. That I can't express. God is absolutely faithful. And absolutely wonderful on our behalf. On that day the Lord will shield those who live in Jerusalem so that the feeblest among them will be like David and the house of David will be like God like the angel of the Lord going before them. Zechariah 12 8. Know that one of the applications of this prophecy from Zechariah is an allusion to the day we live in. The feeblest among them will be like David. Well, that's talking about the warrior company of God rising up to establish the kingdom of God in the times that we live in. The feeblest among them will be like David. That's a pretty audacious statement. We just talked about how mighty David was. He's taken dude's foreskins from him. Times 200. And the least of this warrior company that God is raising up will be mightier than David. Now, we'll be, will we be physically <laughs> cutting off anybody's foreskins? I sure hope not. Let's not do that. <laughs> but what is a foreskin if we're going to get right down to it excess flesh that's what it is so the warriors of God will go out and through the spirit of God and not by a spirit of condemnation but by a mighty anointing they will begin to remove flesh from God's people at large and even those who are not God's people, they'll begin to address the flesh, the rulership of the flesh, the power of the flesh, and subdue it. And then do it in such a way that is more mighty than David. Wow. That's the calling on the warrior of God today. Is that you? Are you somebody that you feel like you have the calling of a warrior of the Most High God on your life. Well, understand that if that's you, when God looks at you, He says, even though you are the least of that company, you are mightier than David. <laughs> you need to understand that that's God's perspective toward you. Because the enemy will try to get in your face. And then you just remember, God says, I'm mightier than David. When he looks at me, that's what he thinks. So the enemy, he just doesn't stand a chance. He's just giving you an opportunity to exercise your stomping power. Put him under your feet. Say, hey, I really appreciate the opportunity to wipe my feet off on you. Thanks. And keep right going. <laughs> I know that I'm getting kind of... Uh, <laughs> feisty <laughs> I want you to know that sometimes God likes a little bit of feisty in the right spirit God never gets afraid of the enemy <laughs> it's like uh, the, this guy <laughs> he's <laughs> he's nothing you should have the same attitude <laughs> When Satan gets in your face, just say, Bud, have you really checked into who my God is? 
<laughs> you should really check into these things before you mess with me. <laughs> that's that's just not smart. See, that should be your attitude. And though it may be hard sometimes, remember that God is with you. He's for you and not against you. And there's nothing that the enemy can do to stop you. As long as you keep running back to God, hey, we'll keep fighting till you win. <clears throat> so in the scriptural example of David's life, can you see how it applies to a personal promise of David, but also the establishment of a kingdom? The kingdom of God in the modern day is entering a phase where it's going to begin to expand and expand and expand into areas and arenas of society that it's not really dominated before. But God wants everyone to know that this whole planet belongs to Him. And we don't dominate others in a, uh, in a attitude of, you're below me. No. That's not how we're called to dominate. We are called to have dominion that brings peace, righteousness, and joy. So you bring righteousness to a situation and you say, I won't take any other answer. I won't take no for an answer. Righteousness is coming. I love you and righteousness is coming. I love you and there's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> you see, we need to have that warrior spirit in us where we know that God has said His kingdom expands and takes dominion over the whole earth. And we know we're on the winning team because the enemy will definitely try to convince you otherwise. You just have to remember God's word supersedes everything else. I want to pray with you today. Father God, I ask that this benefit the people. And I ask you to install a genuine spirit of a warrior on the inside of those who watch this video. And that it would not be a fleshly warrior or a warrior in the eyes of man, but a spiritual warrior of the Most High God with an anointing for victory, victory, victory over every blockade of the enemy. <laughs> in Jesus' name. And I ask that they would have victory with joy. <laughs> May you have joy in the middle of the battle. And may you have joy as a child of God. May nothing steal your joy. And you have a smile on your face in the middle of the battle saying, <laughs> I know the battle's won. <laughs> I'm still fighting, but I know how this turns out. <laughs> that is the joy that just wears the enemy down. <laughs> he gets so tired of sitting there watching you smile all the time. <laughs> Uh, that's what we want Lord that's what you, we want you to give us and I'm asking you to increase that in my life and increase it in the lives of the people that watch in Jesus name Amen God bless you I encourage you to check out my new book The Power Cycle of Creation A Wheel Driven Vehicle this is a spiritual journey exploring the perspectives of God toward all of creation Christian culture mankind and time itself Go to SovereignRoar.com to learn more. On the website, you can also sign up to receive the Judah Watch monthly by email. This is an apostolic commentary on Christian culture and newsletter format. This has been an episode of the Paradigm Shift Weekly. I look forward to seeing you again next week with a new episode of the Paradigm Shift, a weekly video series produced by Sovereign Roar. Sovereign Roar is the apostolic marketplace ministry of Matthew Shoemaker.